Welcome back. We're now going to turn to the topic of the mechanics of breathing, which is a large and important area. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's considered along with ventilation that we dealt with right at the beginning, but it's such an, an important area that I personally think it's easier if we discuss it separately, and so that's what we're going to do. And we'll start by looking at the muscles of respiration. Now, inspiration is normally active, but, resp but expiration under resting conditions is passive, and the lung simply returns to its equilibrium position. The most important muscle of inspiration is the diaphragm, shown here. The diaphragm is a thin sheet of muscle that stretches across under the lung, it's uh, connected to the ribs at the side and the spine at the back. And when it contracts, two things happen. One is that when it shortens, it, it uh, comes down. And you can see that that increases the vertical dimension of the thoracic cage. In addition, when it contracts, the ribs are moved out, as you can see at the bottom. Now perhaps it's a little bit difficult to understand how the ribs move out when the diaphragm contracts, but the way I like to think of it is that when the diaphragm contracts, it increases the pressure within the abdominal cavity down here, and that causes the ribs to move out. The diaphragm is innervated by two phrenic nerves, one to each side of the diaphragm, and these originate very high in the spinal cord, cervical segments three, four, and five. This is very much an advantage because if the spinal cord is damaged below that level, there may be paraplegia or even possibly quadriplegia, but the diaphragm uh, is, uh, remains innervated and so breathing is not greatly impaired. And uh, incidentally, just on a historical note, Galen, the a uh, Greco-Roman physician in the second century was aware of this because he was studying uh, the gladiators who had all sorts of terrible injuries. Now the diaphragm moves down about a centimeter or so during normal breathing, but in a, an extreme inspiration it can move down as much as 10 centimeters. The diaphragm, as I say, is separately innervated so that if one side uh, is paralyzed if the phrenic nerve is damaged for some reason, then one side of the diaphragm does not contract, and that can be easily tested by asking a patient to sniff, and when he sniffs, the active part of the diaphragm goes down, but the passive part moves up because the pressure inside the thoracic cage is reduced. Now the diaphragm is by far the most important muscle of inspiration, but in addition to the diaphragm, we have the external intercostal muscles, which as you can see here, run downwards and forwards between the two ribs, rather like the pocket of a pair of jeans, downwards and forwards. And when the external intercostal muscles contract, they raise the ribs, as pro probably you can see by having a, a, a look at where they're attached here. When the ribs are raised, the diameter of the chest wall increases and also the ribs rotate as shown here. And there's what's sometimes called a bucket handle movement. In other words, as the ribs are raised, the chest wall moves out like that. So um, both the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles uh, assist with inspiration. There are other muscles as well that are sometimes used under more exaggerated conditions. For example, um, if, you're, if the, the subject is exercising or if the subject has severe lung disease and is very short of breath, the so-called accessory muscles of inspiration come into play. These include muscles in the neck and uh, they're not used during normal resting breathing, but they can be used. Now let's turn to expiration. As I said, expiration is normally passive, but during exercise, for example, uh, activity, expiration becomes uh, active. And the most important muscles of expiration are the abdominal muscles. Uh, 
uh, the rectus abdominis and uh, other uh, types of muscles that I won't uh, bother you with. But these contract and they push the abdominal contents in and as a result the, uh, the diaphragm is pushed upwards. Uh, and that causes, of course, a reduction in volume of the thoracic cage. And this is a nice uh, image because it shows the active and passive movements during inspiration and expiration. During inspiration, the diaphragm moves down actively, but it moves up passively uh, during expiration. And during uh, active expiration, the abdominal wall moves in, but during uh, inspiration, the abdominal wall passively moves out. In addition to the abdominal muscles, exp expiration is assisted by the internal intercostal muscles that r run in an opposite direction to the externals and uh, they cause the ribs to move down and that reduces the volume of the thoracic cage. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about the muscles of respiration. Actually, that's a, uh, a rather simplified view, and people who are very interested in them have all sorts of, of uh, additional uh, information about them, but that's all we need in order to understand the muscles of respiration. Now let's move to the pressure volume behavior of the lung. And let's imagine here that we have a lung, an animal lung, or indeed even a human lung taken at, at uh, operation, which can be cannulated, the airway is cannulated, and the lung is then connected to a spirometer. Now we met the spirometer earlier on. One of the important things about the spirometer is that the pressure inside it is atmospheric pressure because of the weight of the spirometer is balanced by a weight on the other side here. Now the lung, as you can see, is inside a jar and we're able to, to reduce the pressure in the jar with a vacuum pump and we can measure the pressure here. And so let's start with the pressure inside the lung, atmospheric, the pressure in the alveoli is atmospheric, the pressure outside the lung is atmospheric and so we're at this point here. And the first thing you can see is that even without inflating the lung, there's a small volume of gas in the lung. That's called the minimal volume. That's actually quite difficult to remove because of the closure of small airways. So that's the minimal volume. And now suppose we turn on the pump and we reduce the pressure to say minus five centimeters of water. And we measure the volume here. And then we go down, we wait a few seconds for the system to equilibrate. Then we go down to minus 10 centimeters of water, measure the volume again, and so on and we plot out the inspiratory limb of the pressure volume curve. We go all the way down to, say, minus 30 centimeters of water. Then we go in the opposite direction. We, we allow the pressure to come up to minus 25, minus 20, and so on, and we measure the expiratory limb. Now, there are a couple of interesting features about this pressure volume curve. One is that it is clearly nonlinear. Now that's quite unlike the, the curve relating length and tension of a coiled spring. If you take a wire spring and you stretch it, the extension, the strain, is proportional to the stress, the force extending it. That's Hooke's law. Uh, so the spring behaves in a linear fashion, not so the lung. The lung is non-linear and as you can see at high levels of inflation, it becomes much stiffer and more difficult to expand. The other obvious thing about the pressure volume behavior is that the path taken during inspiration is not the same as the path taken during expiration. And that's called hysteresis. That's a Greek term meaning that the behavior lags behind the, during expiration, it lags behind the behavior during inspiration. Let's be clear about what we mean by these negative pressures. Sometimes people are confused by this. Minus 10 centimeters of water simply means 10 centimeters of water less than atmospheric pressure. We're relating these pressures to atmospheric pressure. And that's something that's convenient and very frequently done. For example, if you go to a doctor's office and you ask him to measure your blood pressure, he says the, it's 100 millimeters of mercury, for example. He means 100 above atmospheric pressure. 
Imagine the confusion if he said it was it was uh, 760 plus 100, 860 millimeters of mercury. That would be very confusing. So we're measuring the pressures with respect to the uh, to the atmosphere. Now, an interesting thing about these pressures is as follows. Suppose I put a pressure of minus 10 centimeters of water outside the lung here in the jar, and then I close the airway. I clamp it or put a stopper in it or whatever, and then the lung volume, of course, remains constant because the airway is closed, and then I allow the pressure around the lung to come to atmospheric pressure. What's the pressure inside the lung? Well, it's te plus 10 centimeters of water because at a given lung volume, the pressure across the lung, sometimes called the transpulmonary pressure, is going to be constant. Suppose uh, I do the same sort of thing and I, instead of having a pressure of zero around the lung, I raise the pressure around the lung to plus 10 centimeters of water. What would be the pressure inside the lung? Plus 20 centimeters of water. In other words, we always have the same difference of pressure across the lung at a given lung volume, and that's a very important point. We could measure this pressure volume curve using positive pressure uh, inflation. Uh, here we wouldn't need the pump, we'd simply raise the pressure here. We could have a pump that increases the pressure. Uh, we take away the spirometer, we raise the pressure uh, in the lung through a series of plus 10, plus 20, plus 30 centimeters of water, we'd measure the change in volume, we would get exactly the same pressure volume curve. So it doesn't matter whether you inflate the lung with negative pressure or positive pressure, you get the same behavior. Okay, now sometimes we want to measure the pressure volume behavior of the lung in a patient. How can we do that? Well, normally what we do is we measure the pressure not in the intrapleural space around the lung, it's too difficult to do and too dangerous, we measure the pressure in the esophagus, which after all is around the lung, it's in the mediastinum around the lung, we place a small tube, a small balloon in the esophagus, and we measure the pressure. And we normally look at the deflation limb of the pressure volume curve just because that's more repeatable. So over what volume would we measure the pressure volume behavior? Well, why don't we measure it over the, the normal uh, useful volume of the lung, the, the volume that we, we use during normal breathing. So we start at FRC, measure the pressure here, that's about minus five centimeters of water usually. And then in this particular illustration, we go up uh, one liter above uh, FRC and we measure the, uh, the volume, so, so, and, and, and we measure the pressure here. So in this particular example, the pressure change is five centimeters of water from minus five to minus 10 for an increase in volume of a thousand mils. And now we can calculate what's called the compliance. The compliance of the lung is the change in volume per unit change in pressure. And some of you have probably met that term before. Uh, we could talk about the compliance of uh, elastic material as sometimes talked about. So compliance here is change in volume divided by change in pressure, the volume change per unit change in pressure. And in this particular example, it's about 200 mils per centimeter of water, which is about the normal compliance of the lung. And by the lung, I mean both, both uh, sides of the lung together. So that's the compliance. Now the compliance alters uh, in disease. For example, if you have a patient with pulmonary fibrosis, where the lung is, uh, where, where you have a lot of fibrous tissue laid down in the lung, the lung become, becomes stiffer and therefore the compliance is reduced. The volume change per unit change is reduced. Same thing happens when you get edema in the lung because some of the alveoli are not able to expand. Um, and uh, uh, so those are examples of a reduction of compliance. Compliance is increased in emphysema because the, the architecture of the lung is destroyed and the lung is, is not able to have the same 
recoil pressure that it normally does because the architecture is destroyed and the compliance is increased. Compliance also tends to increase somewhat with age. Sometimes we want to measure the compliance of different sized lungs. Now this is mainly in comparative physiology where we're looking at say a mouse lung and a human lung. Uh, of course we wouldn't expect a mouse lung and a human lung to expand by the same volume for the same change in pressure. And in that case we sometimes measure what's called the specific compliance. That's the compliance divided by the lung volume. Now what's responsible for this pressure, behavior, pressure volume behavior of the lung? Well there are two factors. The first is the, the tissue in the lung uh, that we can see with a microscope and, and that is to some extent responsible for the elastic properties. And for example there is collagen, it's a molecule, a collagen in the lung and here we have a an electron micrograph of a pulmonary capillary and you can see the collagen fibers over here. Uh, and there's collagen throughout the lung actually and that's one of the proteins that are responsible for the pressure volume behavior. Another protein is elastin and here are fibers of elastin uh, stained uh, uh, throughout the lung and um, the, these fibers also contribute to the el elastic properties. However, the elastic behavior of the lung is, we believe, not caused simply by extension of these fibers. It's more caused by the change in geometry of the fibers. And an example is what's called nylon stocking elasticity. Believe it or not, that's a term used by, by engineers who are interested in elastic behavior. The point about nylon stocking elasticity is that if you take a nylon stocking, it's beautifully distensible. It's very easy, very, quotes, elastic, very easily expanded, okay? But if you take the individual uh, fibers of nylon and try to stretch them, uh, you'll break your finger before you can stretch them. They're very stiff. And so why is the nylon stocking so beautifully elastic? Because of the change in geometry of this knitted construction as you alter it. You distort the geometry and the same thing probably occurs in the lung. But there's another factor responsible for the elastic behavior of lung. It's very important and we're going to talk about it now and that is the surface tension of the alveolar lining fluid. Now surface tension is a topic that some people are not familiar with and so I'm going to go through some of the features of it here. And first of all, we've got a, a trough of a liquid, water if you, if you like, and let's think about the surface of this trough of liquid. The surface, the molecules of the water attract each other much more than they attract the air above them. And the result is that you've got forces in the surface itself. And as a matter of fact, surface tension is defined as the total force across an imaginary line one centimeter long in the surface. And one way of thinking of surface tension, which I think is useful, is that it's like a piece of very thin rubber sheet which is in the surface, okay? Imagine we've got a thin sheet of rubber and we incise uh, a, a, a line one centimeter long. Now of course the rubber will gape and then we can put sutures in that uh, to bring those two uh, sides together and the total force across the sutures is equal to the surface tension. And the, the units are dynes or uh, per centimeter or millinewtons per meter if you like, uh, but that's the it's force per, per unit length is surface tension. Now an important feature of surface tension is that in a curved surface it develops a pressure. And again, the easiest way to think about that is to think of the surface of a soap bubble, for example, being like a child's balloon, okay, an elastic material. And as a result, you've got tension in the wall of the balloon, and that tension develops a force which raises the pressure in the bubble. Of course, we're all familiar with that. When we blow up a child's balloon, we have to generate a pressure within it to inflate it. Now, a French scientist Laplace recognized the relationships between the pressure developed 
by a surface like this, the surface tension, T, and the radius, and he said the pressure in a soap bubble is equal to 4T, surface tension, divided by the radius. The 4, don't worry too much about the 4, it partly comes because we've got two surfaces and because we've got spheres. So that's the Laplace relationship, very important relationship. And one of the things you can see from this is that if you have two bubbles with the same surface tension, and that's simply caused by the, uh, the tension is, is, has to do with the amount of soap or detergent in the water, uh, the, the tension is, is constant. But if one bubble has a smaller radius than the other, it's going to have a higher pressure. So that means that a small bubble will blow up a large bubble. So this is surface tension, a very important feature uh, in the lung. Now, you may say, why is the lung not unstable if surface tension is such an important effect? There are 500 million alveoli in the lung, approximately. They can't possibly all be the same size, so why don't the small alveoli blow up the large alveoli? And this brings us to a very interesting chapter in respiratory mechanics, and that is the discovery, the modern discovery of surfactant. And it goes back to about the 1920s, when a Swiss physiologist looked at the inflation of the lung when he inflated the lung both with air and with a liquid. And what he found that was that it was much easier to inflate the lung with a liquid than with air. And here's a modern demonstration of his experiment. Here the lung is inflated with saline here and with air here. And you can see some striking differences between the two pressure volume curves. You notice that in the saline inflation, the lung is much more compliant. For a given pressure change, for a given pressure, the volume of the lung is much greater. So the compliance is greatly increased with saline inflation. And you'll also notice, by the way, that whereas air inflation causes a very large hysteresis, the saline inflation apparently does not. So when uh, the Swiss physiologist von Niergaard saw this way back in the 1920s, he said, well, the only difference between inflating the lung with a liquid and with air is that I'm abolishing the surface tension in the, in the liquid inflated lung. So surface tension must be imported in the lung. Unfortunately, at that time, he was unable to measure surface tension. He just didn't have the techniques available. And so uh, the work he did was completely forgotten and uh, uh, it was uh, discovered much later on, but completely forgotten, had no effect on the progress of science. Until the 1950s, when a physical chemist working in England was looking at edema foam coming out of animals that had been exposed to toxic gases. And he noticed that the bubbles of the foam were extremely stable. Now, being a good physical chemist, he immediately recognized that this meant that the surface tension was very low. Because if there's any appreciable surface tension in bubbles, it causes a pressure to contract the bubble, the gas diffuses out through it, and the bubble collapses. So looking at these stable bubbles, he realized that uh, there was something special about the lung. And that was the beginning of the modern discovery of so-called surfactant. Surfactant is a material that reduces the surface tension of the alveolar lining layer. And we can measure the properties of surfactant using what's called a surface balance. Now here's a surface balance here. We have a trough of liquid, and on the surface we can put any material we like. We can move the barrier here, we can compress and expand the surface, and we measure the surface tension with a platinum strip. The details we don't need to worry about. But look what happens if we do this, um, make these measurements, first with water in the trough. So we change the area of the, the, of the surface with this movable barrier, and we find the surface tension doesn't change. It's about 72 dynes per centimeter, uh, and it doesn't change. If we add detergent to the water, we reduce the surface tension, and that's the reason why detergents are useful in washing. They reduce the surface tension. But again, 
the surface tension is irrespective of the area of the surface. But look what happens when we put extract from lung in the surface of this trough. We find that the surface tension varies greatly with area. And in fact, uh, at the end of, an, of a, uh, 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 when you compress the, uh, the area to a very small amount, the surface tension becomes extremely low. In fact, when, it was first, when this was first discovered, uh, Patel, who was the physical chemist, said, uh, I can't measure the surface tension at all. It's so low. So this is very interesting. It, what it means is that, that when Laplace uh, pointed out that a bubble with a very, a very small bubble will tend to blow up a large bubble, here we've got a, a small bubble, the surface is reduced, and the surface tension is low. So that uh, may indeed contribute to the uh, stability of the lung. And we now know that the, the lung secretes a, a phospholipid called dipalmatolphosphatidylcholine, such a mouthful that I can hardly say it, we call it DPPC. And it's a phospholipid which is produced by the lung and reduces the surface tension. And the, uh, before I, I do that, I should point out that, that the surface tension, as you can see here, the, the surfactant has a lot of, of hysteresis, and maybe that explains, in part at least, the hysteresis of the air-filled lung, because the saline-filled lung, where the surface tension is abolished, shows very little, if any, hysteresis. So the surfactant, the uh, DPPC, is produced by the type 2 alveolar epithelial cell. Remember, we saw this cell way back at the beginning of this series. This is a beautiful scanning electron micrograph of a type 2 alveolar epithelial cell. Remember, it's a rather globular looking cell, quite unlike the type 1 cell, which are these cells around here. Uh, and it has these microvilli around it. And you can see the holes in the cell through which the surfactant is produced. And um, surfactant, uh, you can actually see inside the cell, these so-called so lamella inclusion bodies. These are in the cytoplasm of the cell. Here's a nucleus here uh, in the cytoplasm of the cell. And these are extruded through the holes, as we saw previously, and they form surfactant. You can always recognize surfactant because it's got this sort of onion skin appearance and you can see it um, in, um, you can recognize it in the electron micrograph. So surfactant is an extremely important material. Its half-life is relatively short. It turns over fairly rapidly and it's got to, so it's got to be produced all the time. Otherwise, the surface tension of that part of the, of, of that, the lung increases. Now, what are, the, what are the functions of surfactant? Well, from what we've seen, there are three. First of all, it, it increases the compliance of the lung. It makes the lung less stiff. Okay, so in the absence of surfactant, you would have a stiff lung. Secondly, it increases the stability of the lung. Very important. And thirdly, it reduces the tendency to alveolar edema. Now, this is always difficult to explain, but let me have a go at it briefly. Because you've got the, the alveolus with the surface with the lining layer and the alveolus tends to contract, this reduces the pressure around the capillaries in the alveolar wall. And when you reduce the pressure around the capillaries, that tends to ca cause edema fluid to move out. Therefore, if you reduce the surface tension, you reduce the tendency of the al al uh, alveolar edema to occur. And indeed, Patel thought that the primary uh, function of surfactant was to reduce the tendency for edema. We don't normally emphasize that quite so much now. We think the most important feature of surfactant is to reduce the, uh, is to increase the stability of the lung. So what would you expect in a lung with the absence of surfactant? Well, it turns out that surfactant is produced relatively late in fetal life. And some babies, particularly premature born babies, are born with the absence of surfactant. And here's an example here from one of these babies. And you can see 
perhaps, it's perhaps a little difficult if you're not used to looking at these things, but what we've got here is collapsed lung. These, this is lung, this is very unstable lung, which has collapsed in some areas. You can see various uh, areas where, where it's open, most of it is collapsed. The lung was also stiff, difficult to explain, and it had alveolar edema. You can see the edema fluid here. So surfactant is essential for uh, the, uh, the healthy lung, and one of the great advances in this area over the last 20 or 30 years, and I can remember the advances vividly, is the recognition of surfactant, its, its uh, composition, and the fact that now it's possible to produce surfactant from animals, or make it, and administer it to these babies who are born without surfactant, called the infant uh, respiratory distress syndrome, and these babies can often be saved now, and a very important advance. Okay, so we've been talking about the pressure volume behavior of the whole lung. I'm now going to look at the regional pressure volume behavior because this is important in determining the distribution of ventilation in the lung. And so what we've got here is a, a diagram showing the lung here, the upright lung here, and the pressure volume curve. Now, it turns out that the intrapleural pressure is not the same throughout the lung. Why not? Because the lung has weight. And whenever you have a, a, a body with weight being supported, the pressure below it has to be higher than the pressure above it. If I put a book on a table, the pressure below it is higher than the book above it to balance the downward acting weight forces. So the lung is no exception. The lung is supported by the chest wall and, the, and diaphragm, and therefore the intrapleural pressure is larger, higher, at the bottom of the lung than the top. And since it's negative, higher means that it's less negative at the bottom than at the top. Now you can see that this influences the pressure volume behavior. For example, at the base of the lung, the alveoli are going to be exposed to a relatively small expanding pressure, only 2.5 centimeters of water. We can expect the alveoli to be small and that with a with a given change in intraoral pressure, a relatively large increase in volume because we're on a steep part of the pressure volume curve. By contrast, the alveoli at the apex will be relatively large. They'll have an expanding pressure of minus 10 centimeters of water, and, uh, but their increase in volume will be less because they're on a less steep part of this pressure volume curve. So when we talk about regional ventilation, we mean the change in volume per unit resting volume, and clearly that's going to be greater for the base of the lung than the apex of the lung. Now a very interesting thing happens when you go down to residual volume. Now you still have the difference of intrapleural pressure between the top and bottom of the lung, but all the intrapleural pressures are less negative. Why? because lung volume is less and therefore the recoil forces are less, intrapleural pressure is less. And it turns out that at residual volume, the, intra the intrapleural pressure may be as high as plus 3.5 centimeters of water. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because now that region of the lung will not ventilate at all until the intrapleural pressure falls below atmospheric pressure, okay? By contrast, so this region of the lung will not ventilate at all with a small inspiration. By contrast, the apex of the lung has a relatively small expanding pressure, and that's going to increase its volume significantly. So what do you think happens if somebody exhales down to residual volume and then inhales in a series of small steps? Initially, none of the gas will go into the base of the lung, as shown here but after a short period, the base of the lung will ventilate better than the apex after a given volume has been passed. You may say, well, is there any direct evidence of this regional difference in alveolar size? Well, here's an example. These are from an animal preparation where the alveoli were fixed by freezing uh, with the animal in the upright position, head up position, and you can see that the alveoli at the apex of the animal lung were much larger than those at the base. 
Now let's return to this one very briefly because I want to point out, and I mentioned this earlier on, that there is a minimal volume of the lung below which it's very difficult to, it, it's very difficult to get below this volume. Remember we mentioned that when we talked about the pressure volume curve. And the reason is that the small airways close at the bottom of the lung, preventing gas being exhaled from the alveoli. And the result of that is that, uh, and that of course, these, these, under these conditions of airway closure, this region of the lung is unventilated. That only happens at very low lung volumes in young normal people, but with increasing age, that tends to happen even at, at FRC, that can happen, some amount of airway closure. Because in age, the recoil pressures of the lung become less, it's a little bit like mild emphysema, and, and you can get airway closure at the bottom of the lung, even at FRC sometimes. And this certainly occurs uh, in patients with lung disease. Now, we've been talking about the pressure volume behavior of the lung. I'd now like to move to the pressure volume behavior of the chest wall. Now, at first sight, it, the chest wall is not, it, not so easy to see the elastic behavior of the chest wall. It's easy with the lung. You can blow up a lung and allow it to collapse, and it's like a balloon. You can see its pressure volume behavior. But it's much more difficult to show this with, with uh, the chest wall. But here's an example. Under normal conditions, the pressure inside the alveoli is atmospheric, the pressure out here is atmospheric, and the pressure in the intrapleural space is, say, minus five centimeters of water. This is because, if you like, the lung is pulling in, but at the same time, the chest is pulling out. And you can see that because if you now introduce a bilateral pneumothorax, that is to say you put air into the intrapleural space around the lung, then two things happen. The lung collapses and the chest wall springs out. And we can sometimes see that in radiographs. Here's an example of a pneumothorax of the right lung. Now you know when we're looking at a chest x-ray, uh, the patient's left is here and the patient's right is here, so this is the right lung. And this is a pneumothorax of the right lung and you can see the lung is collapsed right down here against the mediastinum. And the chest here looks, looks very black because the x-rays have gone through it without encountering the lung tissue. And if you look very carefully, you can see that the ribs are more horizontal on this side than on this side, and this means that the chest wall has expanded. By contrast, if we look at a patient with fibrosis of the right lung, where the compliance is reduced, the lung is very stiff because of the fibrous tissue inside it, like a scar, then the, the lung is contracted, it's very small, and you may be able to see that the, the ribs are more oblique on this side than that side. The chest wall is pulled in. Now finally, I'm going to deal with what is a somewhat difficult topic, at least initially, but isn't really, and it's, but it's a very nice summary of the way uh, the, the uh, lung and the chest wall interact with each other. And these are called the relaxation pressure volume curves. First of all, how do we how do, we do this? Well, uh, we have a subject here who is breathing in and out of a spirometer, and at a particular volume, we close the tap, we measure the pressure in the airway, and the subject completely relaxes. In other words, the respiratory muscles are not working at all. Now, this is difficult for an untrained subject to do, but subjects can be trained to do it, and you can also do it during anesthesia, but uh, an, a trained subject can do this while he's awake. Suppose we have him go to FRC, functional residual capacity, that you remember is the, nor the, the end of a normal expiration, it's the resting volume of the lung. Suppose he goes to FRC, we close the tap, and we measure the pressure in the airway. What do you think the airway pressure will be? The answer is it'll be atmospheric pressure, because the FRC is the equilibrium volume of the lung and chest wall. They're in equilibrium, and therefore uh, there is no tendency of the lung and chest wall to either spring out or to pull in. But if we, and so 
this is the curve, this curve here is for the lung and chest wall. And you can see at uh, FRC, the resting respiratory level here, FRC, you can see that the relaxation pressure curve, the relaxation pressure is uh, zero centimeters of water. Now, if we close the tap above FRC, then the system tends to move, wants to move down, quotes, wants to move down to the FRC volume. And so the pressure is going to be positive. If we close the tap up here, the pressure, the relaxation pressure is going to be positive. By the same token, if we go below FRC and we close the tap, we have the subject relax, then we develop a negative pressure because now the lung and chest wall are trying to expand to the equilibrium position, which is FRC, okay? Now, so that's the lung plus chest wall. Now let's look at the lung. Well, the relaxation pressure volume curve of the lung is exactly the same as the curve that we measured a long time ago here, except that we're measuring it with positive pressure. It's the same curve, but if we inflate this lung with positive pressure, we would get the relaxation pressure, uh, pressure volume curve of the lung itself. In other words, if we, if we uh, inflated the lung with positive pressure and we measured the pressure in it at a given volume, that would give us the relaxation pressure. So that part is quite easy to understand too. And notice we go down to minimal volume. That's the lowest volume of the lung. Now the only one that's going to be a little confusing perhaps is the relaxation pressure volume curve of the chest wall. We can imagine that being measured in someone without a lung, only with a chest wall. And the point about the chest wall is that at FRC, the relaxation pressure is minus five centimeters of water. And I should have pointed out that the lung itself at FRC has a relaxation pressure of about plus five centimeters of water, okay? But that's balanced by the relaxation pressure of the chest wall, which is minus five. In fact, at every point here, the lung plus chest wall pressure is determined by the difference between those two pressures. Here you can see at FRC, you've got plus five here, minus five here. Here at, uh, what, 75% of the uh, of, uh, vital capacity, you've got the chest wall has a, uh, the lung has a relaxation pressure of say plus 10 or something like that, and the chest wall has got zero, and the lung and chest wall are the same. So this, this is, encapsulates a lot of information, and initially it's uh, rather daunting, but uh, if you work through it, it's, it's a very nice way of seeing how the, the lung and the chest wall interact. So let me now just summarize uh, some of the main points we've made. Respiration, uh, in, in respiration, inspiration is normally active, but expiration is passive, and you go down to the resting volume of the lung, which is the functional residual capacity. The most important muscle of inspiration is the diaphragm. In fact, if the intercostal muscles are not working, uh, the diaphragm still is able to do a pretty good job in ventilating the lung. Uh, in inspiration, the most important intercostal muscle is the external intercostal muscles, and at high levels of ventilation, you use the accessory muscles as well during, during uh, uh, heavy exercise, for example. The most important muscle of expiration are the abdominal muscles, uh, but they are assisted by the internal intercostal muscles. We then looked at the pressure volume curve of the lung and saw that uh, it's easy to measure and two features of it are that it's nonlinear and also that there's a good deal of hysteresis. We talked about the definition of compliance, which is volume change per unit pressure change and how that can be measured in a patient by measuring the esophageal pressure as an index of intrapleural pressure. We then talked about the, 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 um, what was responsible for the properties, uh, the elastic properties of the lung, the pressure volume behavior of the lung. Two categories, one is the, the fibers within the lung, the collagen, elastin fibers within the lung, 
and the second is the surface tension. And we pointed out how important surface tension is, that it, it explains the difference in pressure volume behavior of saline filled and air filled lung. And we indicated how we can measure surface tension and the fact that the surfactant, DPPC, uh, is extruded from the type 2 alveolar epithelial cells and that surfactant is produced relatively late in fetal life and babies who are born prematurely may be born without surfactant and in which case the lung is unstable, stiff and liable to develop pulmonary edema but that now artificial surfactant can be used to uh, tide these babies over that difficult period. We then talked about the regional ventilation of the lung which, which explains, which can be explained by the fact that the intrapleural pressure is not the same at the top and bottom of the lung and we went through on the different patterns at FRC and residual volume. We then pointed out that air trapping occurs at the base of the lung when the small airways close. We then moved to the pressure volume behavior of the chest wall. We used the example of pneumothorax <coughs> and then we finished by talking about the relaxation pressure volume curves which encapsulate so much information about the relative behavior of the uh, lung and the chest wall. So that's the end of what we call statics, those are the pressures and volumes and next time we're going to move to dynamics and talk about airflow and airway resistance. Hope to see you there.